Welcome, I'm Peter Coronius, and with me today is Patrick Fair. So thank you, Patrick, for joining us. My pleasure, Peter. And welcome, SIAN members. Um, Patrick, it's been a fairly tumultuous 12 months. We've had COVID, the pandemic, you know, on, on us. Uh, but the, the government hasn't been sort of caught napping here. They've been busily uh, um, legislating in the background or conducting reviews. And recently you've written a very excellent summary of the main legislative instruments that are either have been recently reformed or in the process of reform. I thought today we'd just cover a few of those and get some high level points from you on concerns you've got or anything that you think might be of interest to our colleagues, not just in Australia, but also internationally. Certainly, Peter, it's, it's been an extremely demanding time for people in regulatory affairs with the government throwing out uh, reports and issues, sometimes acting, sometimes not acting, and uh, pushing through legislation you know, at, at uh, breakneck speed that had made significant changes to the, um, the national uh, framework for protecting um, our cyber security systems. Mm. Yeah. And I think the other point to note just at the outset is that some of these laws are, are not without controversy. You know, there are definitely implications here that I, I think we might draw out a little bit, if you can, for us, uh, for civil society and, and individual freedoms, and also, I guess, the commercial op operations of companies in Australia and multinationals, even, for, for whom this is a bit of a uncharted territory and may have implications for the global business. I think that's right. I think the uh, red tape element of some of the requirements is pretty heavy, pretty heavy handed. And there'll be a real question as to whether uh, the new laws are gonna be a dead letter, rarely used and not actually um, um, uh, uh, implemented by, in the case of national security infrastructure anyway, the making of rules with a large cross um, industry impact. But um, uh, you know, that's certainly the potential. And uh, the other thing is that some of the powers that are being introduced are being uh, introduced in the old framework with the old expectations as if they were a paper warrant, but the powers um, uh, relate to electronic systems and devices and therefore the implications for um, what law enforcement might be able to do with the powers and for the um, privacy and um, you know, uh, the political implications for the potential targets is quite significantly different from what it would have been if it hadn't been just a paper power. So you're suggesting that um, because they're attempting to grapple with the digital dimension that the previous, the, the legacy paper-based warrant system may not translate well in terms of checks and balances? That's right, yeah. Right, I see. Okay, well, let's turn to uh, a number of these. We're not gonna cover all of them today, but I would um, direct our members and those that are watching this video to your excellent summary, which we will attach to this video. So people will be able to uh, go and look at in a little bit more depth about some of the points that you're raising today. Let's start with the new framework for the security of critical infrastructure. So as your summary reads, and I might need to uh, magnify that a bit. We've got the Security of Criti Critical Infrastructure Act of 2018, which is um, abbreviated to so. Socia, is that how you <laughs> yeah. say it? Uh, requiring the owners of traditional, of certain nominated ports, electricity, water, and gas infrastructure of scale, and other infrastructure nominated by the minister to be placed on a secret register and required to report ownership and operational details. So that's the first, now that's a new obligation, is it, in this bill? No, that went, that became law in 2018. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, when I say of scale, the ports are actually named, but in the case of the other pieces of infrastructure, the test is something like they serve 100,000, um, a population of 100,000 um, in terms of their scale. Mm -hmm. And there's a special measure for electricity generators because, as you, you know, imagine, they don't serve a particular area of the electricity shared. Um, and the uh, the two things that the government were interested in is, you know, who owns you, and tracking that back to see if there's a foreign, a national foreign interest owning it there. Right. Um, and also, uh, have you got your control system set up and operation set up so that it 
creates a risk to Australia, for example, if a power station was managed offshore um, in a, um, a foreign jurisdiction or key gates and control systems were accessible offshore. So that's what the Act currently says. Right. And what the update talks about are the, are the amendments. Uh, proposed amendments to right. the Act, which really change its character quite significantly. So let's just park that for a second and just go back to the original Act. So clearly what the government seems to have been trying to address here is the nation state threat. Primarily, if you're looking at the potential for foreign ownership and control of critical infra information or critical infrastructure, it's in this case, it could be, it's, it seems to be largely talking about physical infrastructure, but it wouldn't preclude something like a telecommunications network either, would it? No, under the bill as it was, uh, under the Act as it uh, is law now, telecommunications isn't mentioned specifically because there's a telecommunications security framework which is in the Telecommunications Act directed right. at national security issues. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say though that some things in the um, communications framework might not be um, nominated by the Minister as critical infrastructure, for example. Under the existing scheme, if the Minister wanted to, he could pick a large data centre mm -hmm. or a, a, a electronic marketplace um, uh, or some other system that was critical to the operation of government and declare it critical infrastructure and then those rules would apply. So in other words, you're saying there's sufficient scope within the current Act that things that would not normally fall within the ambit of the current regulatory environment under Telco could be brought in under this regime effectively by, right. by a declaration. That's right. But the requirements are only those, those are reporting requirements. Mm. Um, I should maybe sort of give you the context. If you, um, you have to do a filing um, if you get nominated, and then you're under an obligation to update that filing within 30 days if anything changes. Right. And the minister, meanwhile, has a power to direct you to do any act or thing um, which he judges as being uh, adverse to um, national security. So mm -hmm. if you report that you've had a change of ownership, and then the minister might come back and say, well, I want that transaction cancelled or reversed, or if you report that you're using a uh, at-risk um, outsourced service provider that the government has on a blacklist, then they can come back to you and say, no, you're not doing that. So the framework is designed to require basically large asset owners and operators mm. to be thinking about national security and the government's potential to intervene in their um, operations and behaviour um, in the interests of national security and thereby you know, stay um, out of, out of um, the reach of the minister and his powers. Interesting. And so in terms of this, all this discussion so far is around the ownership and control of the infrastructure, as in the entity are we talking about, or specific assets within the entity? Uh, in, uh, it's the entity um, okay. that owns the assets. Because uh, there's a reason why I make that or sought that distinction. Um, uh, as you recall, under the recent Trump administration, there was a directive from the president to uh, sequester incoming electricity generation infrastructure. Do you remember that they, they purloined this massive generator that was coming in from China and they wouldn't allow the electricity uh, provider to take collection of that because there was a, a fear that it, can, that it had been compromised and it was gonna be going on a network and therefore it was introducing a vulnerability into a grid situation. Would this uh, legislation as it currently stands without the amendments touch on a situation like that? Um, without the amendments, it, it could if, um, if the uh, uh, operational report required being updated mm -hmm. and the minister got that update and decided that uh, there was a security risk, then the processes that are in the legislation now, which involve a consultation step and a sort of advisory step before the minister could exercise his powers, mm. um, that could be called into, into operation. But mm. it wouldn't be, um, it, it isn't as, um, uh, as direct as the, um, uh, if it was a, a system of, um, uh, of uh, uh, national significance under the amending legislation, then the powers are much wider and, and much, more focused on the possibility of having the Australian Securities Directorate 
you know, come in and <laughs> examine the assets. Right, but just, just to, to, to clarify that point, you're saying that the, an operational change of the nature that I described could be uh, enough to trigger um, a ministerial intervention if, uh, yeah. if, if they deemed that there was a security threat attached. That's right, yeah. that's right. But, but you're right. talking talk about this very significant scale of the infrastructure and, yeah. and you'd, uh, um, you'd first get the soft power sort of minister advisory and then if you didn't like that, the minister can go away and get a, a ASIO to um, make a, a security assessment and if right. that's adverse, mm -hmm. the minister has the power to direct you. And could they seize the equipment under that power? Would that be one of the the powers open to the minister is to order the surrender of the equipment or or at least some assessment of it? Uh, well, um, the, the power, as I recall in the legislation as it stands, is um, is very broad. It's, a, it's pretty much the minister can you know take such steps as he considers necessary in the circumstances. Right. So potentially that's doable, but it's not listed. It's not listed, but it's, it's within the... The theoretical contemplation of the, the bill or the act as it currently stands is great. Oh, I mean, why I, I went down that path just then was to really see whether there was much consistency between what's happened in the US and what could happen here under the legislation. Because I think clearly what we're seeing within the cybersecurity community um, is, you know, that the supply chain vulnerability is becoming a huge uh, um, vector for, for attack and infiltration of networks. And of course, uh, as you know, you rightly point out, we're talking about major infrastructure facilities here, which would have an impact on the economy and presumably health and safety of the nation, things like that. So that's right. These are uh, this is the direction that um, I guess cyber has been moving in in the res in, in respect. Well, we haven't really seen a kinetic attack in Australia against uh, you know something non-digital up to this point, except one or two cases, which we could probably talk about later. Well, the, the main one you might recall was the Vitek Bowden uh, breach on the Mar Maruchi Door Shire Council water supply. Yeah, Remember that yeah. back in about 2000? And it was a disgruntled um, contractor that had a, a beef with the council and decided he was gonna hack the valve system that controlled the sewage flows and basically polluted the drinking water with 200,000 litres of sewage and I think received a suspended sentence, jail sentence for that. But to my mind, that was really the only tangible uh, evidence of, a, of an attack against physical infrastructure using a cyber sort of a weapon. But this bill really moves us into that realm now, this act, that uh, the government's thinking very clearly that this is something that we're going to see more of potentially and they want to have the instruments in place. I think that's the focus of the legislation as it stands now. I think the, um, as amended, the, the bill will have a much wider remit and go to things like you know, protecting uh, confidential information and uh, protecting um, uh, um, the valuable commercial information uh, generally, you know, um, maintaining a, a sort of a robust and, and resilient um, sort of economy at a, at a, at a much more iterative level. Mm. So let's talk about those amendments. I hope you're still following this. So let's just recap. We're talking about the a new framework for the security of critical infrastructure. So these are the major infrastructure facilities of the nation, uh, the utilities and, and things associated with that. So let's look at the amendments now that are on the table and, and uh, they're now before the parliamentary committee. The first thing that they, they have done is they've um, defined what could be um, a critical infrastructure asset quite broadly by naming sectors. Mm -hmm. And the purpose for naming the sectors seems to be that depending on which sector you're looking at, the party that is the responsible entity is the regulated party in that sector. So on the financial sector, mm -hmm. um, it's deposit taking institutions and, and um, other regulated um, financial entities over in telecommunications, it's carriers and carriage service providers. Mm -hmm. And then when they get to things that aren't um, fully regulated, they talk about um, um, features and scale. So mm -hmm. uh, food and health are, are, are included, the space industry is included. And so the, the, you read this act and you see this very broad definition 
Mm. But um, nothing gets activated unless um, the minister makes rules, which include um, the asset um, in, in the obligations. Mm. And the making of the rules can determine uh, whether the asset is included and also what obligations might apply to the asset. So um, it's just giving us a scope to cover you know, a very, almost all the Australian economy. You have to work hard to find something outside the sectors that I mentioned mm. um, that's of any, any significance. And if the minister makes a rule about, uh, about um, an asset and it's not clear whether the minister will make a kind of omnibus rule just saying, you know, every bank or, you know, every um, bank branch or um, and something like that, or whether there'll be, you know, well, we're going to pick this one and that market, and, you know, so, so that's up for consultation. Right. But once, once you get picked, then, then the next thing is they can say, okay, now, these uh, these obligations going to apply to you, and the first is you have to have a um, a, a plan, a, a cyber security um, strategy. So you need to document how you're securing your network, and and, mm -hmm. and then you have to do an annual report right. as to how you've performed, and also you pick up an obligation to um, report um, cyber incidents. And so this isn't like. The, under the Privacy Act, where you have to tell the people who've been compromised and mm -hmm. um, you know explain how they can remediate the breach. This right. is just a report to the regulator saying right. I've had these breaches. Yes. And if the um, regulator, if they don't like the report that you give them annually, then they can get they can ask you to put in an independent auditor mm -hmm. and get a the auditor to give them a report about your infrastructure. So essentially, it's a way to um, force assets that are deemed to have a critical role in different parts of the industry across Australia to make sure that they're, you know, in a professional way, thinking about cyber security and managing it. Right. But also, um, you know, it has a kind of red tape element in that, you know, what board of, um, you know, of, uh, of any competence in Australia of any significant asset hasn't already got some kind of a cyber security plan in mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. So what they're really picking up is this obligation to report their the reports to, the, yeah. to, the, to the department yes. and also to do the annual filing. Right, right. So let's take a hypothetical situation, assuming the bill went through in its present form. Uh, a company or an infrastructure uh, owner, uh, their, their system comes under a cyber attack. Uh, they may not be able to determine the source of the attack but they can definitely tell that there are outages occurring that have been attributed through their own internal investigations to cyber. At what point does the reporting obligation trigger? Is it as soon as they've identified the, the attack itself or do they have to you know, provide details as to the nature of the attack and what the possible uh, origin of the attack is? Where, where where does their reporting begin and end in that kind of situation? Uh, look, that's a good question. I, I'd have to look at the pr provision in the Act and, and the precise obligation, but my recollection is that it's um, it's um, immediately. Right. <laughs> and it's uh, it's not... Uh, I think the, the intention is that the details of all of that is going to be worked out. In the right, rules. I see. Um, but the other thing to say is that that's, that's the layer for the... Um, for, for the general um, economy, there's also a concept in the um, amending legislation of systems of national significance, mm -hmm. and this is where uh, a um, an asset is thought to um, uh, be critical um, in um, in that it, um, there's an interdependence between that asset and other critical systems, mm -hmm. and so if you if you, if you, um, you because of that interdependency you you are particularly vulnerable or present a particular risk, then you can be deemed also by rules or a ministerial declaration to um, be a system of national significance. Right. And if, if you're deemed that, then um, uh, you have the obligations which we've already mentioned. I should say that, you know, the ones that are in the Act now also apply. So reporting mm -hmm. ownership, reporting systems, yes. and then having your cyber plan and then reporting breaches and then doing an annual report. Mm -hmm. But now you also must participate in a, um, in a, 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 a sort of a war game regarding a cyber security incident if the, if the government decides. So you'll, you'll, there'll be a, um, a proxy incident and you'll have to participate and work out how you'd respond and, and that will be monitored and reported on. And there are uh, other powers applying to um, systems of national significance, including 
you know, if they want to, the Australian um, Signals Directorate can come in and mm. or, you know look at your systems and make recommendations and possibly can control them. This is know, before an attack has occurred. Are you saying yeah. once they've declared it to be a system of national significance, uh, this is they can do all these when, other when, things when when considered you know reasonable and necessary. Right. Them. So uh, it's an elevation beyond just the uh, national. Uh, what is it? The uh, owners of certain nominated critical infrastructure critical assets. Infrastructure. But if it goes to the next step, which is a, a uh, asset of national significance, you're saying additional obligations can come in yeah. that require would, would permit a more interventionist hand of government yeah. uh, digging around and testing, That's trying right. to break things. And yeah, and, and also, you know, they're requiring you to, you know, put your cybersecurity team and some of your systems and people into a into a um, you know a, a, a simulated, simulated yeah, event yeah. To, to see how you'd handle it and, right, and, right. and what you know who you should talk to and right. what you need to do. It's, it's, One last point about that that's quite interesting, of course, with uh, an, a national security framework already in the telecommunications legislation, the first thing that the telecommunications industry said about this is, you know, are we included and why? Mm. And the government um, uh, politely described it as parallel. <laughs> 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 I.e., yes, you are included, right? <laughs> and and so, of course, the uh, the telecommunication industry will be saying, "Well, look, can you decide? You know, do we really have to have one framework over here in the Telecommunications right. Act and this whole separate framework with potential overlap?" Because they are not exactly parallel. No. I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with the telecommunications regulatory you know, environment. Clearly, not as much as you, but it seems to me that there would be significant overlap. With some of these new obligations that are present in this bill and even in, in the act that uh, underlies it with that, that, that right. goes I mean, beyond what they had to do already. Certainly the, the, the power of the minister to review and reject is mm. already legislated right. uh, uh, in relation to changes to the telecommunications infrastructure that might be adverse to security. Right. So let's just wrap up on this point. In a moment we're going to look at another um, uh, piece of legislation which is the Surveillance Legislation Amendment Identify and Disrupt Bill. But uh, we might just bring this segment to a close now, just to wrap up to say that we've been talking about, I've been talking with Patrick Fair um, on the uh, new framework for the security of critical infrastructure uh, and on the, I guess it's the 2020 amendments to the uh, 2018 legislation. legislation that had passed in back then. And uh, this act will touch upon primarily the owners of uh, major infrastructure assets in Australia.